Okay, so welcome to everyone. So today's speaker is uh, Abilasha Barga Spanzel. And so she completed her doctorate at Purdue and she's now a principal engineer at uh, Intel, focusing on uh, hardware based security. And uh, today's talk is about uh, what she called uh, fearless computing. That, in other words, how can we use computing in all aspects of our life uh, without being concerned about uh, security? So thank you to the speaker. Thank you, Antonio. Um, I hope you can hear me all right. Yeah. Perfect. So hello, everyone. My name is Abhilasha. And as Antonio said, I am a principal engineer at Intel. Um, I just wanted to note that today I'm speaking, um, I'm not speaking on behalf of Intel. These are my thoughts uh, expressed as an individual. So just wanted to make a quick note of that. Um, let me start by uh, expressing how uh, happy I am to be here. Um, as Joel mentioned, it's coming home in a virtual fashion to, uh, to a serious talk. I still mention um, serious as my second home. You know, I have a very high regard for many professors, many staff members, and we continue to stay in touch. Um, and I, I really enjoy working with the students, uh, past and present, and uh, hope to do a lot more as we go forward. Um, I still remember the first time I um, entered the second floor of recitation, double doors, and I had my first one-on-one uh, -on -one with Professor Spafford. And I remember how it was, how he introduced information assurance uh, security to me. It wasn't just a bag of a lot of fun techniques and tools, but looking at it more holistically, looking at the overall bigger picture and how, um, you know, the importance of ethics and also looking at how to do what is right. And that really very much resonated with me and it, is, uh, it continues to be a driving force going forward. So don't get me wrong, we, you know, understanding the holistic picture doesn't mean that you don't get into the fun, gory details. I enjoyed every bit of, you know, going the cyber, uh, the crypt analysis of the S boxes with Professor Wagstaff, you know, the AES analysis, or the stealthy attacks on the network analysis of forensics tools, even the password management, like with our psychology department. So it was very fun to go over each of those focused areas in great detail, but also the opportunity to step back and see how these various pieces fit together and uh, understand and ask the question of why are things a certain way they are and how we can make it better. So a lot of my uh, focus is talking about that holistic picture and um, for what it's worth, I was told that there are a lot of undergrad students who would be joining this. So just this fun interdisciplinary research led to four different majors and minors at the end of undergrad, just one PhD though, as Antonio mentioned. So my role at Intel started about 2007 and I continue to work together um, and plan to do a lot more as we go. So let's get started. So if you take something that is uh, very well known in the world today, um, they are over a billion connected computing devices. One thing that we know for sure is that we will have a billion more and we'll have more and more of these devices with increasing innovation and we are working relentlessly as part of the industry to provide innovation at every single level, you know, the software, the hardware, different types of user experiences to meet the needs of the future. So we are definitely looking at how we can continue to innovate and provide newer experiences. If there was um, a way to understand what are the various threats that emerge from these new form factors and new usages, that would help us get ready and get ahead of the adversaries. Because it is true with the increased number of these devices and the new usages, things that we may not have expected when we started um, and how it's continued use may impact our lives. It becomes very important to understand the various threat models. So if we look at this computing in a slightly different way, we can also see how we interact with these devices. So whether we are in the restaurant and paying with our mobile device, we're in our 
communications, you know, having a very important uh, conversation online, making telehealth possible in these post-COVID conditions uh, where we could um, communicate with our doctors, with specialists, being able to provide media that allows you to uh, detect, you know, being able to detect diseases, to be able to provide the healthcare that folks need. All of this is becoming very important. The online education where Purdue, by the way, has done an amazing job with, you know, global students online with a much farther reach. I was just talking before this call started on the amazing opportunities that, um, that online education has provided. Without the geographical boundaries, the kids now have the ability to reach out and be part of a much bigger learning ecosystem. You have kids from all over the country, all over the world that are working together and the number of opportunities has exponentially increased. These are great things that you can do together um, by having a lot more closer relationship with the uh, information that is available. The number of devices per person, the number of connected devices by themselves is just going to increase. And we want to make the most of it, being able to not um, be tethered by any of the boundaries or constraints that uh, may come with uh, how things are today. My work day is also changed like many others within uh, the corporate workforce. Uh, typically, we had eight o'clock, you know, driving to work, you do your work, you come home. But in this post-COVID, uh, we are oscillating quite a bit more between uh, the personal life and work life, you know. Uh, this is data that was collected by our uh, IT on how the various, how the work pattern has changed over the last um, several months. And like many others, my, my life also is, you know, being able to do certain things at work, being able to context switch, you know, get things done from the, uh, from the um, home perspective and being able to switch back. So the ability to uh, switch back and forth without compromising some IP or uh, being able to make sure no confidential information leaks or also from the privacy perspective, you know, having home information uh, be part of another ecosystem, it becomes very, very important. So for all these amazing opportunities that are out there, it is important to note the amount of uh, attack, the attack surface, the attack surface that exists in each of these domains. And some are slightly different and many are the same, like you have ransomware attacks, that um, make you second guess. I have calls from my parents sometimes saying, hey, I really would like to do this purchase, but if I click here, is it going to land up compromising my bank accounts? In the same way, you know, uh, in whether it is in healthcare, you know, getting the services with the confidence of not losing very, very sensitive information about yourself. The number of, I didn't put the stats here, and if anybody wants more information, I'm happy to provide, but the number of attacks, say, on the education sector, how kids are constantly online, we were just talking about many, many hours of being in front of the screen, clicking on links to get into a certain classroom. What happens if, the, if what you're clicking on is potentially a phishing attack, or it is collecting some uh, information that can be potentially misused? All these are real concerns. It's not something which it is well-founded and there is increased fear due to the increased number of attacks. And what we want to do is a better job of combating this. And with this compute becoming such an important and integral part of our lives, wouldn't it be great if we can do all the wonderful things that we just talked about without the constant fear of backlash? So this is what we mean by fearless computing. And uh, I, I, we believe that this is what will help us innovate, use all the services provided to us freely and still without fear, be safe by design. So we're gonna talk about a few different techniques. There are a few different approaches that we are taking towards that goal. So let's get started. So first one is, Security by design. 
Now the goal is to provide taking the burden away from the user to uh, some extent possible and providing a design that protects you uh, by default. So an example is if you look at a PC in front of you and uh, see what um, what all is on the system. You have applications, you know, for different, um, you know, personal and work uh, 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 the work uh, applications. You have the operating system running these various applications, and then you have the hardware supporting. So all so all uh, software runs on hardware. So you will have the ability to uh, look at the entire stack. An interesting thing is that as we know that all, uh, all of the software depends on the hardware being secure, there's a foundational aspect uh, uh, with respect to security that is embedded in the hardware itself. Another thing is we know that our most precious asset is the data itself, and that continues to be something that we protect, whether it is in storage or is it in memory. If the data is lost, everything is, because that's the most uh, valuable asset that we have. Um, and we want to always protect it by design. But what I'm going to focus on for the next couple of minutes is uh, on the execution or the compute aspect of it. So the idea over here is to make sure that when we are executing these various applications, how do we ensure that you have a safe space where you can continue to use those applications freely without, um, without the compromise that we talked about? So looking at it holistically, uh, the first piece is understanding what the gap is. So we have all these applications that are coexisting next to each other. I bet I have about 20 or 25 different applications open right now. This is with a lot of work trying to close everything <laughs> before the presentation. And I'm sure the younger the, the students who are on can handle a lot more applications coexisting on the platform. The problem with uh, today's architecture is that there is a single OS where if it is compromised, the rest of the system gets compromised. Not all the applications are built the same. So you have some which have higher trustworthiness than the others, some are more protected. Some, like my kids, they like to go on to stack, uh, you know, they like to embed messages and photographs or, um, you know, looking at certain interesting websites which allow you to look at some new techniques that are out there to create new fonts or you know, faces and profiles. Those are things that are very interesting. But one fear over there is that what all unintended um, uh, um, potential pieces of malware that it can come along with. And uh, if you were listening um, to my home, you know, like the talk, and I realized it yesterday, is I, I kind of shouted back at, not shouted in the sense of um, anger, but a general response is, hey, yeah, please make sure you don't download any virus the second you, uh, the, the second you click on a certain link. So this constant fear of clicking on a wrong link because you're in an unknown place which may resolve the rest of your system. Is there a question? Yes, but so, we, we, we can answer later, I guess. We usually answer all the questions at the end. All right, uh, okay. Yeah, please, yeah, I'll leave room for a lot of questions. So please have the questions coming and I will um, definitely um, answer um, all of them and the discussion would be great. The key thing over here is um, as people install TikTok and a few other applications, uh, they, they do have access to a lot of data, which is one and zero. You know, if you want to use it, you, you basically click yes and continue, which in itself is um, a potential compromise. One way we could approach is give them a different PC, you know, having, if you're doing all this stuff, you go play, pick one PC if you're doing things that I can count on, like, you know, something which is approved, you go to another one. That's in the kid case. Even as adults, if we are doing our taxes, maybe people have a separate PC in their basement. And if you're doing some other financial applications or uh, confidential information with respect to your company, et cetera, you're in a different, um, uh, you're in a different space. But this is not very user-friendly or practical. We are un 
with a variety of various applications that we talked about, it is not trivial to be able to have a separate system for each type of application. However, one of the key things that we are trying to drive towards is through virtualization-based security. So using virtualization allows us to create best of both worlds. Essentially, you create a solution that would allow essentially two PCs on a single PC. And with the virtualization technology, it would get the benefit of the isolation that we desire for the various types of workspaces at different levels of classification or the trustworthiness. It is also very beneficial because it allows us to take the innovations happening in the cloud space. So everything runs everywhere model where you have applications that were built for Linux or for Android or for different OSs, you can actually support different models, keep them isolated and get the benefits of the cloud innovations on your endpoint. And this, has, um, this is now possible a lot more than in the past with significant advances in performance and in the actual underlying virtualization technology. So this is something that I encourage folks to look at and um, I'm happy to engage further with more details um, depending on your interest. So the second piece is um, privacy. Something that is super important, we've emphasized it as part of our interdisciplinary research quite a bit. And um, the key thing here is it's not a choice between security and privacy. You need to be able to provide one without jeopardizing the other. There are different uh, examples that we can think of in the use cases that we talked about. For example, if it is a dad working uh, from home and other people walk in and um, take a sneak peek or not intentionally in a bad way, but the ability for the system to provide some visual cues, some feedback about, hey, I'm not gonna lock my entire system, but the ability to blur the system, having the system more context aware about where it stands and what else is on the system. Virtual workspaces to separate private data by design. Like, so if you have those containers and uh, which are encrypting the user-centric data so that you don't upload a bunch of the audio video that you didn't intend to leak to the rest of the cloud services that you may have access to. So the ability to protect by design the data that is being generated in your own safe space is something that is possible and can be done and something that we can strive towards as we go. Another example associated with privacy is the ability to take compute and bring it to uh, the local compute, like being able to move, for example, learning or other AI algorithms and not send all your data to be aggregated in one backend, but being able to have it in a more distributed fashion. Professor Spafford actually talked about um, a, a internet in a PC idea in several years back. And we uh, had a really interesting discussions on building on top of that. But the idea is to take some of the compute that uh, having a choice of where you are able to send your data, how much you are disclosing. And if you can actually use the emerging uh, network as well as the compute capabilities to do things in a much more distributed fashion. This is where we think that the future of compute is going to also go ahead, where uh, you provide the edge, the endpoints to be an integral part of the entire experience and not just as a portal to uh, some service that you are consuming. We could talk all day about privacy and I'm happy to engage on that aspect as well, but there are also some non-technical pieces that are uh, important to note. There are several uh, government regulations. Folks may be familiar with uh, GDPR, with the HIPAA for healthcare. There are some very geo-specific ones uh, like that or certain verticals. There are also ones that are looking at um, like uh, uh, based on the type of um, like the state that you're in or the type of job that you may be in. For example, you may have uh, commercial for classified in, in certain government areas. There are certain regulations that need to emerge even more strongly, I believe, in education as it's becoming a lot more online. 
But uh, some of the fundamental open questions that we talked about, uh, even when I was in college, on who owns the data, who is really responsible for providing the privacy um, folks or ensuring that the, uh, there's compliance with privacy, a lot of those questions are still pretty open. So I encourage our researchers to look at that, the look at the composition problem, which is looking at all the data flows and the risk associated with it. And there are a few really good uh, papers on that, but I think it would be very interesting to understand from your uh, comprehensive, looking at it as a research area perspective to see what it means in today's connected world of what, how the privacy regulations can help the various technologies play a good part and assure uh, a certain level of confidence to the users. The next thing is uh, with security and privacy and something that becomes more and more interesting because the ability to allow Johnny to encrypt or for, the, uh, for a particular technology to succeed is the simplicity and the ease of use. We have had many very, very good ideas, but if they are hard to deploy, if they don't work with legacy, being able to have a brand new brilliant idea, but very, very um, uh, hard to actually scale with makes it much uh, makes it very hard to move the needle. An example and a very important one is with authentication. So when we started with our access control studies, learning about the exact policies associated with a certain privilege level, a lot of the time identity authentication was based on something you know, just put a password or a pin. Many of us who spent uh, enough time on it understand the problem with it, you know, being able to have strong passwords, being able to update it, and the availability of these passwords um, in, you know, the availability of these passwords in the dark web. Um, I, I have lots and lots of news articles, and so you may have, uh, you may have some too where millions of records, like just yesterday, I think in an Indian newspaper, I was um, reading at a global level, millions of records were compromised just because of a grocery website being hacked. We've seen enough and more examples uh, here in the, U in the US where our passwords are compromised. And we've gotten so used to some of these that we sometimes overlook the fact that yes, the password that is um, holding a lot of the access to a lot of very important resources is something that I need to rethink and re-engineer. And it's very hard even for the best to come up with something totally new and not forget it. So something you know is definitely an important aspect, but it is not sufficient because it is likely that you have, uh, it, it is compromised from one way or the other. Two-factor authentication or stronger authentication has uh, definitely taken up over the last several years. And uh, what, where the industry is headed is, is looking at multi-factor authentication. Your devices are very rich with sensors and ability to actually get your fingerprint, your face, and being able to combine the information that it can read from you. And the something you are becomes an integral part of the compute itself. So you don't have after six hours or 10 hours of computing, you don't have to ask the user who they are if you have enough data to, um, to verify their identity. Location, for example, is another factor that is used to authenticate a user. An interesting aspect though, is understanding um, what else is out there um, which can help us continuously authenticate. I doubt there are a few of us who just do one transaction and leave. You know, and, and we have nothing else to do. We are constantly working and it makes sense for these long sessions. It's not just a bank transaction and we are done with compute. For these very long transactions and very cached credentials, the ability to continuously authenticate uh, the users to make sure that you continuously have uh, assurance that it is the right user who's getting the service that is intended. So while these uh, continuous authentication methods are being talked about in the industry, we also have to remember the second point that we talked about, which was the privacy aspects. 
just because we want to make sure it is the right user with security. And we want to make sure it is really usable. So don't keep asking the user again. We cannot compromise on the privacy aspect because we need to have all three together to be able to provide what is really intended. So you cannot send, say, the biometric data out to the cloud to make sure that, yes, it is the same user, but have methodologies that allow you to protect it uh, in a way that you can locally compute continuous in a continuous fashion and provide just the for example, a cryptographic token that allows you to uh, provide the confidence needed to provide the service. And uh, as we know that the strength and the confidence increases with the number of factors. So an attacker has to do more than one thing to be able to pretend to be you or impersonate you. My final point that I want to highlight here, um, and it is an important one, is the importance of diversity and inclusion for cybersecurity. It is, we have seen, I've been very privileged to have a family and like um, an upbringing where it was not a question of um, making sure that it is, uh, you know, what women can do or, um, you know, depending on the math skills or anything else, it is always sort of by nature, you knew that you have all, everything is possible. It is also true that with, um, you know, the, in the wider world, it is a problem. And one thing I really like at Intel is you see a problem, you own it, you drive it, you, you make a difference and not, you know, be on the sidelines. So one of the things that um, I hope to partner with more people and for those who are listening, is to see how we can really make a difference in having more women in, uh, in computing, in cybersecurity, because our attackers, the adversaries are diverse. They'll come in all different uh, types of attacks and um, having a stronger, more um, uh, well-rounded, well-thought-through solutions require, uh, requires a diverse and inclusive workforce for cybersecurity itself. So this is one thing that I'm, I feel very strongly about and I'm hoping that we can do better and better as we go forward. Another point is also related to getting them early. So before they learn that they said there's something that they cannot do, uh, which unfortunately sometimes is the case. Um, I like to work with elementary, middle school, high school kids and the amount of innovation and like they don't, they are not constricted, uh, constricted between boundaries, uh, the ability to get them together and um, start teaching them early is something that has been done in Sirius before. When I was college, Sirius did great STEM efforts in the past. And as part of my work at Intel, we work with the community too. So there are some amazing efforts out there being able to build some synergy and drive a lot of the good efforts uh, forward is something that I'm hoping that we can do uh, as we go forward. So it's all about action, not just the words. And one thing that I want to take from here is the ability to actually drive a vision with fearless computing. One of, one of the Nobel uh, laureates, Rabindranath Tagore, has been my driving force for a very long time. Uh, one of the poems that he mentioned, which says, where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free and the world is not broken into fragments by narrow domestic walls. The whole poem, and I encourage you to go check it out. It's really good. It talks about a world where you are building with confidence. You are allowing the freedom of thought, the freedom to do things in a very truthful and, a, and drive uh, excellence in everything you do. It all comes in having some of those safeguards in place and building the right kind of environment and choices that we can give to, the, uh, to all the users. So as a summary and call for action, I have three key things. One is technology uh, related, where building the right, understanding what options are there and building the right security, privacy and usability hooks in place as part of your design and uh, consider it as part of that holistic solution. Second is uh, not everything is just technology that we have stressed again and again. 
understanding what are the various uh, policies, laws, regulations to help us drive these changes. So it is together that we will get the overall solution. The next thing is, um, and very, very important, is the ability to have the awareness. Um, I think in one of our serious talks, there was a good amount of uh, stress, rightfully so, on the education aspect of it and building awareness, not just to protect ourselves, but to help folks uh, become part of this uh, cyber talent pipeline, build a strong and diverse cyber talent uh, pipeline. And that those were my key points. I'm happy to go back to the slides if there were any questions and talk about details or answer any other questions. Okay, uh, we have some questions on the Q&A interface. Um, I guess the, you, you already answered the TikTok one or, or I, I can just read it. So uh, how do you define attacks? Is it only TikTok one attack or several, one attack or several million? one for each kid that clicks through the permission and has all their data uh, vacuumed. Like. So, um, yes, I'm, and I, I think you clarified a little bit uh, further. I think this is- Yeah, fascinating. I mean, to add, there nowadays a lot of attacks are not clicking on a link or a buffer overflow, but having people uh, compelled to install something that has dual purpose and I can add exactly. maybe privacy risks. Yeah, it's a very good question, right? Sometimes it's take it or leave it, um, where you, if you don't give users a choice to be able to use that application without having to give all your data or access to all your system, that in itself would be uh, something that um, this particular type of architecture may support. So if you do have a virtual workspace where, which is isolated from the rest of the system, it allows you to install something which may potentially have dual purpose. It may also want to scan the rest of your hard drive, but if it doesn't have access to it by design, it, then there's a certain level of protection and mitigation that you get. Yeah, and then there is kind of a follow-up that says, how do we handle situations where an app says it cannot work unless you provide a certain permission, even when it's obvious that uh, the permission is not needed, uh, but but a user might have a social pressure to install that app. Uh. Right, uh, it, it is. A, it's a very important uh, question. You know where um, it, where where you you know you should provide. I think as a society and as we are working towards it, the ability to provide a choice to be able to have those uh, applications work you know, without uh, having that social pressure that you're mentioning to have to install that apps uh, to be able to, um, you know, uh, to be able to basically be part of a classroom or to be able to go ahead and, um, com you know, contribute in a certain way. This is the second part of it. And you have rightfully indicated, you know, having the right regulations and guidelines, the legislation pieces to ensure that people have a choice to continue to use as part, um, you know, as part of, uh, you know, the platform or application design itself. Technically, it is possible, and it is something that we can definitely provide a solution. Those regulations would definitely help us get there. And I'm happy to engage with you further on seeing what are some good uh, follow-ups that we can do there. Okay, so oh, we are getting a lot of questions. So. Another question is, uh, I guess, uh, what about security of software and hardware supply lines, especially the issue of buying products that are that might be already uh, compromised? Yeah, this is a very important aspect. It's uh, I recently got a system uh, just because I, my, the motherboard was fried, and I say, okay, fine, let's change it. And I, I normally take care a lot about the systems that are coming, but even after doing all that, I realized that it was it wasn't a genuine piece of hardware um, and it was just because of knowing what to look for 
this is something that as an industry, Intel is spending a lot of time in the supply chain and making sure you have the tools and information uh, that you have for supply chain assurance. Uh, and um, being aware of what's happening here is something I would definitely encourage uh, Ralph and the team. But at the same time, um, asking for more, like seeing, hey, I have this much information. What about some other aspect? Not considering the whole hard piece of hardware as a black box. This, it's a complex system with a lot of different parts. So better understanding of what's below the operating system becomes more important than ever today. Okay, so follow up on question one. If an app still wants my name, if I do not provide my full name, then I would be violating the terms of service of the app. I guess that's not really a question, it's mostly a comment, but. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how often you actually put your real name. I have an alternate identity for a lot of the things. It's like, if you, we need to drive a better system. We work towards a better um, single sign-on and federated identity to allow people to have to go to service after service. That was actually my thesis at Purdue. But the ability to go a step further and not you know, being able to minimally disclose information only as needed, there has to be a real reason why you're asking for the full name. So the ability to drive some of these through technology as well as regulations would be something that uh, we need to strive towards. Yeah, I, I, guess, I guess the underlining questions here is like how much we can do with uh, technology and how much we can or we should do with uh, regulations and uh, right it's a combination it, like yeah yeah and, uh, and of course some of these things can be handled at uh, if there is a market that checks apps the market might might verify that the app if it's asking for something is because the app really needs that but let's say complicated Topic. It is indeed so, complicated, but doable. And if it, it's, that's the whole thing about taking ownership of a problem. So if you see yeah. that there is a problem, you know, being able to write about it to make sure that we can drive the changes that will make a, provide the choices going forward. Okay, other question. For the proposed hypervisor segmentation, you spoke, you spoke of, of to allow separation of work and home data. Are you recommending a pair host solution such as uh, VMware or a more distributed solution where companies provide uh, a web-based solution uh, such as uh, VNC to provide employees access to work-based software? Yeah, this is a good question also. Um, essentially, um, you will see as uh, with most of the operating systems like my latest Windows 10 system, uh, the, uh, the hypervisor is built into the operating system. You're not, uh, it, is, uh, it is as part of the OS itself. And you can actually run whether it is a VMware workstation, but also the built-in uh, VMs that allow you that, you know, it's like opening up another application. Even the browser, like I know you might be familiar with incognito, for example, process level isolation but you can actually click like Windows Defender for Application Guard, or you can provide virtualization-based security, which is now an integral part of the operating system itself. So a lot of work has gone into to make it more mainstream. It's not like how it was 10 years back, where we opened up a separate VM to do one-off things, but making it second nature, making sure that we can actually use it just the way we use all the other applications. So even like my kids, they use it. Whenever they're doing this uh, National Cyber League or some of the hacking competitions, it's always in a separate VM. It's just a click, which will allow you to open up. It's not like how you have to configure it and how it compares to, for example, RDP or you know some of the virtual desktop infrastructure type solutions is that in this case, your computer is local. You're using the client, which is virtualized and you have full access to it. They are models which um, sometimes are a bit expensive and you know where you are um, running this on the back end and you are uh, um, accessing it from your PC. So uh, that may be suitable for certain cases, uh, for example, call centers and some areas where folks actually use it. But as a user, as you as a user at endpoint, you have these capabilities that is available on your system today. 
this is true for um, all the major operating systems, Linux, Google, Microsoft, yeah. Okay. When do you think is the right time for people to start learning about the internet safety? I guess the right age, maybe. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I really enjoy learning from the kids too. Like I remember my first internet safety class was when my kids were in uh, kindergarten and I, you know, I just went and this is, okay, let's give it a shot. Let's see what happens. And the kind of questions they asked was like, really taxed it, like, you know, like understanding the question and it becomes not as a surprise uh, to them because computing is such an integral part of our lives. They're going to see your phone and your devices, no matter what, for them to not just get paranoid, but get comfortable with either information that can potentially go like, hey, just don't click any picture you click is going to potentially be out there for a very, very long time. Being aware of things that will help them protect themselves. I don't think it's ever too early. Um, it's not about getting them hooked on just, you know, looking at a screen, but the awareness is super important. And um, I personally, at least in my experience, I haven't seen uh, it being too early, even at an elementary school level. Um, at every stage, they are, the way they are exposed to computing, especially in the post-COVID world, I think it's critical that the kids understand the implications of, uh, like, you know, protecting their own information as well as clickbaits and you know the general stuff that uh, one should be. Uh, the TikTok application, for example, has come up. You know, like understanding what data is being revealed and being cognizant of it. I'm not saying not use it, but I'm, use it with a certain level of awareness and responsibility. Okay, and we have other two questions that are somehow, I guess, the same. Um, so going back to the first topic, uh, this, this person say, uh, the point is that the suggestion of having a separate computer or a separate environment implies using an alias. Uh, uh, However, uh, almost all services that have a term of, terms of service uh, requires that you provide a real name. So by providing a real name to multiple uh, environments, then your activities can be linked together. So, and I guess then the, the same person says, uh, uh, the problem is not really, is not only technical and cannot be solved uh, with a technical solution because companies they should, uh, will not implement it because there is nothing to compel them to do so. Yeah, I agree with you. Like at the end of the day, the kind of information that even if you had aliases, being able to really pinpoint it as you is, uh, is not very hard, especially because you'll have some biometric information. You get on with your camera or something. So the amount of information that you have available uh, seem to link to your real identity pretty quickly. The ability to have pseudonyms and um, you know filters for some of the other applications still are pretty reasonable. Like I have so many different applications that uh, especially kids are exposed to nowadays. And um, I, there is a very well-defined like how much information, you don't have to tell everyone what your birthday is or your, pet's name and stuff like that. We want to be very, this is, this comes on, um, uh, this, this comes over as, as part of the education piece that we talked about. And I'm happy to talk more. Uh, if, you know, this, this is not maybe, I'm happy to have a, a much more in-depth discussion with you because um, whatever it helps to make a difference and help, I'm totally game for that. So, but maybe we, I think we can we can uh, allow this person to speak, but yes, I, I'm not sure how to do it. Uh, I guess. Uh, I'm sorry. Which person would that be? Yeah, because it's anonymous, so I don't know. I think so it's crazy, Adam. On the chat, it says anonymous, so I don't know how to do it. And I agree with one thing which is being uh, implied here that technical measures me. doesn't dodge me. real issues and there is always a combination of technical piece yeah as well hey. as the legal yeah thank okay. you uh, we can I, I, I don't know how the anonymous thing happened and when it actually got switched on because uh, yeah 
But anyway, so so that's where I was going is that um, it's all good. There's technical solutions for everything. However, they just don't work because the way things are applied in social setting, um, the companies basically take this shortcut over us. Like you just mentioned the day of birth. There's, a, I don't know how many applications have asked me for day of birth um, without ever needing to do so. There are only There's only a limited set of them that required you to put, that actually would legitimately require you to be over 13 or over 18. So where I'm going with that is that um, if people don't answer those questions, they just don't get to play. And especially for the kids, uh, like this is this is bad. Like even at school, everybody wants to use GroupMe. Some people want to use TikTok. And I'm like, no, I'm not doing this. And, you know, I'm actually running those apps in a in an emulator. But the point here is. Uh, how do we actually create something that will compel companies to play by the rules and then have uh, the social pressure be on them, not on the individual? This is this is where I think we should start looking at, at going because otherwise it's not going to, there's not going to be a market motivator for those companies to change their behavior. I totally agree with you. I mean, there's yep. nothing that you can do technologically if, they, if they're going to ask you for that data anyways for other reasons. Exactly, so, yeah. Uh, the ability to, um, the, there are two aspects of it, as we talked about, right? Like there is the technological, like how we can by default create an environment so the user is aware and is in an, say in an isolated space, but also the legal, the guidelines, the regulatory <laughs> pieces, which provide that pressure that is needed as, as the right thing to do, you know, being able to not require someone to uh, have um, reveal their information, whether it's date of birth or other things, as well as stronger privacy regulations. So these are things that has to come together from different ways and don't disagree yeah. at all. And I'm happy to engage further. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. To look at that. Yeah, and I also think that maybe academia has more of a play here because we're in the position to to set the tone of certain conversation and come from a scientific side and basically push for some of those legislation changes even where, where if the legislation says, hey, you know what, companies cannot require particular type of information um, or they can require particular type of information to operate, maybe the person is over 13 or over 18, but they have to provide alternative means for this to be attested, you know, that that's something. But I'm, I'm just kind of brainstorming that the, the reason I'm bringing it up is because my head is spinning around this and I'm not finding a good solution. That's why I kind of wanted to throw it out. Uh, at yeah, I'm, I'm with you and I appreciate you bringing it up. Um, I 100% agree. It is a combination of the different types of um, like being able to look at regulations, being able to work together with them to help educate and set the right thing. So I, I encourage you to please uh, continue with, you know, I'm happy to have a follow up and as part of academic research, providing the proposal. Uh, so. Yep. Definitely. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. I guess we have uh, one last question. And what are the three soft skills that you think are useful in the field of cybersecurity? I don't know why three. I guess I you can three. mention maybe some. Yeah, I think. Um, let me just see what three come to mind, and it may be different depending on how things are. But being um, uh, what I've learned is uh, being approachable and making sure that we can have the engagement. Like just now we were security, cybersecurity is a very touchy subject. Like it will allow the, it impacts us as human beings. It impacts our children. It impacts the society. It's the ability to uh, be open to ideas, approachable and think of it more with an open mind is very important. Uh, if you say, I've got my way and that's the only way it's gonna happen. It is unlikely that we're going to find something that will have the right consensus and you know uh, the strength to actually pull through you know uh, in over a period of time so i think that is an important soft skill the other thing which i like to encourage especially the ones who are just starting is not to get intimidated there are a lot of folks it's, it's so diverse it's, it's interdisciplinary everybody comes from their own area being able to constantly learn uh, but not be um, impacted by it. if you see that you're in a situation where you're surrounded by folks of different skill set. Um, so I think uh, the strength to continue the perseverance, determination, those types of soft skills will let you go through. It's not 
that you become really good at making one thing and then you're done. I have been learning every day of my life and I think many others in the field are the same, even after many, many years. So I think these soft skills definitely help in working together and uh, continuing to strive for excellence as we go forward. There were more than three there, <laughs> but yeah. Okay, so thank you to all the participants and thank you to the speaker. And uh, we had a lot of questions, that, that is good. And uh, yeah, and see you next week to all the students. Bye. Thank you, bye -bye. it was wonderful. Reach out to me if you have anything, yeah, for sure. Bye, bye Abby, this is Adam, it was nice talking to you. Yeah, likewise, Adam. Thank you, Abby.